Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm Tim Miller. Uh, I am here today uh, with Fred Guttenberg. Uh, he's an activist uh, whose daughter, uh, Jamie, was killed in the Parkland shooting. Brother Michael died uh, uh, from triage after 9-11. Uh, he has a book, Find the Helpers, and another newer book, American Carnage, about uh, facts about gun safety and gun violence in America, um, and has an organization, Orange Ribbons for Jamie, uh, a lot to talk about, um, and, and Fred, I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Thanks, Tim. It's actually good to join you. <laughs> actually, <thank laughs> you. some of these aren't th- uh, some of these aren't that good, I guess. Actually, <laughs> I, as I said before, we got on. Um, I'm a big fan, and and I'm and I'm actually really I am glad to be on this with you. I, I appreciate everything you do. All right, I appreciate you too. And um, I was listening to one of your other interviews, and. Um, you get a little smile. You said uh, you have a kind of a policy about people that come up to you and want to want to talk to you and, and kind of dump their own trauma on you at times. And you said you have a permission to be honest that you give yeah. yourself. And permission to be honest is is sometimes saying, "Yeah, I, this isn't doing anything for me to talk about this right now, but I appreciate it." So I just I want that to be the policy here on the podcast. If I'm going somewhere and you don't want to do it, we can. There, we've got a ton of ground to cover. No, listen, I, I appreciate it. Um, I started that probably not long after the shooting where, you know, people would always come up to you and say things like, how are you doing? You look like you're doing okay. And and it was sort of like, I think they were waiting for me to make them feel better. Right. And I, I got to a place where um, I got tired of responding to it. Not, I didn't want to be mean. Yeah. But if you're going to take the time to ask me, I'm going to take the time to give you an honest answer. Um, and uh, my wife struggled with it for a really long time because sometimes you don't want to answer. And that's also being honest when you say, I don't feel like talking about it. Um, but but yeah, I try to be as, as authentic and as candid always as I possibly can. It's what people deserve. I really appreciate that about you. Uh, okay, so I, w- I want to talk about kind of get into that kind of how you deal with a tragedy like this for listeners that maybe have obviously nobody's gone through the exact same thing as you, but everyone has has tragedy in their life. Um, but yeah. but just for folks who aren't familiar with your with your story, uh, can we just kind of back up and and talk about obviously the Parkland shooting is now six years ago. A big reason why I wanted to do this is we're taking a break on the podcast from from doing constant punditry all the time because we're we're about to have the longest presidential election in history. It's important, uh-huh. but we do plenty of talking about that at the Bulwark. And, and people always say this about, about gun violence and shootings, right? You only talk about it in the three days after something happens and then, and then or four days or five days, and then it goes away. And so I, I kind of wanted to have this conversation apropos of not a specific shooting. And so it's been six years. T- tell people about kind of what led up to that day um, with your brother and kind of what that what that day was like for you. Yeah. So as a reminder, the shooting was February 14th, Valentine's Day. Um, and you mentioned my brother. My brother passed away four months prior to the shooting, October 17th, 2017. He was a first responder um, at 9-11. He was a physician. My brother actually ran the triage for the World Trade Center. He was in the World Trade Center before the second building was hit, and he was in there in one of the connecting buildings when it all came down. He and his team of 10 physicians hid out in a big garage storage facility, pulled down the garage door, waited for the noise to stop, but they breathed in all that stuff. And while amazingly everything around them turned to rubble, the room they hid out in didn't. And he and his team spent pretty much the next 16 days at Ground Zero um, treating patients. Everything was fine until 2013 when he had pancreatic cancer. Um, He had surgery, chemo, radiation, and seemed as if he was going to cheat death again. Um, And in 2016, it came back first in his lungs, then his stomach and his liver. Mm -hmm. I'm one of five kids. We've never dealt with loss before. My dad is 91. My mom is 87. And they're probably going to outlive me. (laughs) <laughs> okay, I mean, we've we've never dealt with loss before, um, and so it was hard. 
on this Valentine's Day, um, my fan, my kids who love their uncle and my wife and I were, we were in this process of moving forward from grief. People who've been through grief understand. And I had this idea that I wanted to help in that process. And I really wanted to make this Valentine's Day very special. And I was going to introduce my kids to the romance of the day. I was going to take my old VHS wedding tape that the kids had never seen because it's on VHS <laughs> and digitize it that day. And we we're going to watch it as a family that night. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. My kids that morning, as is any morning, were running late, blaming each other. And what I remember about the morning and will haunt me forever. And I, if, if people walk away from this interview with one thing that they remember, it's going to be this. I didn't tell my kids that morning. I love them. My last words were, you got to go. You're going to be late. I was rushing them to go to school. My last words were not, I love you. And I spent the past six years telling parents and children and friends and lovers to just do one thing. When you say goodbye to somebody, say I love you and look them in the eye when you do it so they know you mean it. Because um, I didn't. And it was supposed to be like any other day. I, I, I ne It never should have mattered. My kids were in school. It was like any other day. The normal texting back and forth through the day until just after 2 p.m. Um, when my son called me, and he's a jokester, so I didn't believe him at first. And he said, Dad, there's a shooting at my school. I said, what do you mean there's a shooting at your school? And he watched after Jamie like a hawk. I mean, they were typical siblings, but boy, he protected her. And he said, and I can't find Jamie. And the second he said that, I knew this was real. Um, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You, where are you? Where is Jamie? He's like, Jamie's in the, the, the freshman building is what they called it. But I'm on the campus. They're making us all run. But I don't want to run. I've got to go find Jamie. And I'm on the phone with him, begging him to run. I tell him, I'll worry about Jamie when we hear, boom. And that was the shooter on the third floor killing my daughter. Um, and if people want to know why I am so committed to doing what I do, I live with that sound in my head. And, and, um, I met my son after that. The, oh, the kids ran to a Walmart, uh, not far from the school. And I picked him up there. And the first thing we did is find my iPhone so I could know where Jamie's phone was. Now we knew it was still in the building where the shooting happened. Um, we hoped she dropped it. So we were waiting for her to use somebody else's phone to call us. One by one over the next hour, hour and a half, all of Jamie's friends who we knew she would have been with had checked in with their parents and none of them had seen Jamie. My wife and I um, then proceeded to go to the hospital in separate cars. We were in two separate places. The crazy part of the story is while I was dealing with my son and getting him to my in-laws, my wife was at a preschool across the street on a lockdown, okay, because of the shooting. Right. And the, the the child, my wife's a pediatric occupational therapist. She was doing a handwriting class. The child she was protecting was Congressman Jared Moskowitz's son. Oh, wow. And, and if people who know my story know, I consider Jared a brother. I love the guy. His family and I, we are deeply connected. Um, we, we knew each other before the shooting, you know, just from the community. Sure. But, but heck, before I did this interview, I was on the phone with him, okay? He's, he is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, so he's been so great, just as an he's, aside. He's, he's, he's terrific. I, I could have told anybody that that's... Listen, if only Calmer would have reached out to me before you saying Smurf, because yeah. as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, that was a bad idea. Um <laughs> But, but yeah, while my daughter was getting killed, my wife was protecting his son. Wow. 
And so when Jen was finally able to leave that school, she and I made a decision to go in two cars to the hospital where the injured were being sent. That was our next hope, was right. that my daughter was going to be on an operating table somewhere. Yeah. Um, so we went to the hospital. We were there for an hour and a half. Um, after an hour and a half, it was clear that not only was she not there, she was not being brought there. They checked all the other local hospitals. She wasn't in any of them. One of my um, closest friends is a Coral Springs police officer who was at the scene earlier. Um, as I'm leaving the hospital, I call him um, and I tell him, you need to go back. I need you to go see if you can find Jamie. And he did. And as I'm driving home, my wife is in the car in front of me and Scott calls me and he says, where are you? And I told him where I was. He goes, do me a favor. They had a reunification set up at a Marriott hotel. He goes, meet me at the Marriott hotel. I said, I don't want to go to the Marriott hotel. I want to go home. He goes, I know, I, but that's where they're telling us to have everybody come. I said, Scott, I want to go home. If you know anything, tell me now. He goes, meet me at the Marriott hotel. He didn't want to tell me over the phone. Right. No, especially when and, you're driving. Correct. And I said, Scott, what do you know? And he broke down crying. He just said, she's gone. And now I'm getting emotional. And my wife's in the car in front of me. And she keeps looking in her rearview mirror and she can see. So now she's calling me wanting to know what's going on. Um, and now I sound like Scott. I'm saying Scott wants us to meet him at the Marriott Hotel. <laughs> I didn't want to tell her. Um, and she's like, no, no, no. You know something. I said, Jen, we're driving. I said, let's just meet and let's find out everything together. She's like, you know, you need to tell me now. I said, I'm not going to say anything we need to pull over and so we were on the highway we pulled off at the next exit and on the side of the road is where i had to tell my wife my daughter was dead um and that was february 14th jamie became the first publicly identified because of it because the, it it quickly got out right um in a matter of an hour helicopters from media flying over my house, my phone ringing with media, media showing up at my door. Fortunately, I'm friends with a lot of police officers and they literally came and shut down my block to stop it. And they spent 24 seven in front of my house for the next week. Um, but um, that's what happened that day. Are you and, you and Scott, are you still like in the police force down there? I mean, how do you, do you guys still talk? How do you deal with that? Um, he's family. Yeah. Um, we, we are, heck again, another person who I spoke to this morning before this interview, um, he's, he's family to me. You spoke to him today. Um, his, his wife is family to us. His two daughters who were friends with my daughter, we all met because all of our kids were in dance together. Um, we used to go on dance competition trips together. Um, and no, we talk every single day. We get together throughout the week. Um, I, my wife and I deal with it a little differently and he and his wife deal with it a little differently. Um, I, listen, I have no problem, let me rephrase. I talk about what happened freely because I can't change that reality. I am so thrilled and happy for all the other kids like Scott's kids who are having their amazing lives while I'm desperately sad and my wife and I that we're not, but I can't avoid those conversations. Right. Um, you know, for my wife, for mom, there's a more there's there's less talking about the reality of what happened probably even less of um the the a lot of the other moms they struggle with talking about the mom things that they're doing because they don't want to upset my wife right so 
Um, we've had to start having like literal conversations with friends saying, you know what? It's time for us all to just freely discuss again. Yeah. We can't change our reality, but we are happy for you. And, and, and so, but it's been, it's been different, but no, Scott's my brother. I, I, I love the guy. Um, and he is still with the police force. Um, Wow. But he was traumatized by this, as yeah. law enforcement often is. I want to ask one more thing about that day, because uh, I've heard you talk about it. And uh, you mentioned his daughters on the dance team. And I just, I, 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 it's the hardest thing I had to listen to you talk about was the other girls on the dance team and, and the, what the name is, why the name for the foundation is what it is. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing what they did that night. Yeah. A lot of people thought, the name was because orange is the color of the gun safety movement. Orange ribbons for Jamie. That is. Yeah. Orange ribbons for Jamie. Um, that is not the reason we started a foundation called orange ribbons for Jamie. Um, orange was Jamie's favorite color. Um, and all of her friends knew it. She loved orange. The, the night she was killed, all of the dance kids got together with the dance studio and made thousands of orange ribbons. And they, they came over our house late that night. They all, they gave the ribbons to my wife and I because they wanted us to make sure at her funeral, everyone would have one. And then they marched up to her room and they all just broke down up in her room. Um, it was, it was a, a horrific scene. I, I um. Uh, and those kids, I, 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 we're still in touch with these kids. They're, yeah. they, we, I love these kids. Um, but they made these orange ribbons. And at Jamie's funeral, um, her eulogy, I talked about it. And I talked about all of the orange ribbons and the start of an orange ribbons movement. I didn't know what it really meant. Um, but I knew something was going to come of this. Um, there's another part of that eulogy that I want to tell you about. Um, okay. About three weeks later, I was in a Home Depot. And again, the connection is still to this day boggles my mind because of the orange sign. Yeah. Um, but someone came up to me. I was wearing the orange ribbon. I wore it every day after that. And they asked me what it was for. And I told them. And they said, did you know that's the color of the gun safety movement? I had no idea. That wasn't my world. And I came home that day and I said to my wife, I want to start a foundation um, and um, I want to call it orange ribbons for Jamie. You know, I said, it's too much of a coincidence that gun violence has a movement where this is the color and I want to make this the symbol of the movement. And in fact, we did. Um, you now see. Yeah. It helped that Speaker Pelosi, who I love dearly, um, started wearing the orange ribbon. Um, but we gave them out to every politician to, at every event. And the orange ribbon is now the symbol of the movement. And our foundation was created to um, invest in causes that always matter to Jamie in life, but also to educate on why her life was cut short. Uh, so that's how we started the foundation. Um, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've never talked about the eulogy in six years on any interview. Um, there, but there is another part to the eulogy that is very meaningful um, and relevant to the upcoming election. Okay. The morning of Jamie's funeral, um, the former guy, Trump, put out a tweet. And he blamed the Parkland murder on the Russia investigation. Um, I still have the tweet to this day, but he did. And he said to the, that if the FBI had been spending less time on him in Russia, that this would not have happened in Parkland. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, yeah. And I went ballistic. I went crazy. Now, here I am. I'm supposed to be getting ready to go to a funeral. And my wife's trying to calm me down. Um, and I wouldn't calm down. So I went and I did what I started to find very therapeutic. Um, I wrote. And I rewrote the whole ending of my funeral, um, of the of the eulogy. Of the eulogy, yeah. Uh, as and it was a statement to Trump, and a direct um, reply to his tweet, 
and basically making it clear you do not have my permission to talk about how my daughter was killed, to politicize why she was killed. You only have my permission to engage, if you so choose, in a real approach to doing something about gun violence. Um, and I, at the end of the eulogy, I broke down crying. I turned around. I hugged my wife and my rabbi. And the rabbi whispered in my ear, he goes, turn around. And I turn around, and we were like 2,000 people at the funeral. Sure. And they're all, and they included the, at the time, Governor Rick Scott. Um, wow. Everybody was standing up, giving a standing ovation. I, I, I think maybe it had a lot to do with the entire eulogy. I know it had a lot to do with that end. Yeah. And Rick Scott, people forget this. I, it's, it's, it's crazy that we've gone backwards among I don't know who we is in that sentence that Republicans have gone backwards since then and what they're willing to do on gun balance. But Rick Scott actually passed some modest gun reforms after that, you know, which you didn't see from Abbott in Texas, for example, after Uvalde. So Rick maybe, Scott, maybe you did get into his little, into his little lizard brain with that. You know, for a period of time, Rick Scott and I spoke very regularly after the shooting. I mean, he and I developed a real connection. Um, and Rick Scott promised me that he would sign legislation to address what happened in Parkland. And in fact, we did. We passed red flag laws. We passed a waiting period. We raised the age of 21. Real substantive stuff. Rick Scott wants the world to forget that he oversaw that, that he was a part of that, which is why I've come to despise him, which is why I will do anything to see him not get reelected. He had the chance to be a leader, not just in Florida at that time, but in the Senate now. Yeah. You know, nobody's saying you have to say you're against the Second Amendment. No one's saying you have to say you have an issue with guns. Be honest. This was gun violence. Work with me to end gun violence. But he didn't. The Republican Party hasn't gone backwards. They've actually solidified in on exactly who they are. Yeah. And that's this party has has solidified in really on who it is on basically on democracy and other things. Um, there are people in that party who are not that way, who are reasonable, but they're too weak to speak up because they're afraid. Yeah. And the only way to get them to speak up, in fact, it's the reason why former Congressman Joel Walsh and I have become such close friends and why we're going to literally start a speaking tour across America that we're kicking off in February at the Biden Center for Democracy. We'll call them Two Dads for Democracy. Because he and I both are going to tell everyone to vote for Biden and vote only Democrat in 24. Joe and I both believe democracy requires two functioning parties. And the only way to get the Republican Party functioning again is to annihilate it in 24. And failure to annihilate it in 24 is something I just can't even fathom, but we must. Well, there's evidence for that in 20. I mean, that was my case in 20 for a Joe Biden landslide, is that that would prevent this fucking asshole from re, re, you know, reanimating from the dead. Um, but here we are. I, this is, these things are related. So I, I do want to get into the politics next, but I, I, wonder, if, I wonder if the answer to this question is, is related to politics. But uh, one other personal question for you, just hearing you talk about that day and that eulogy, and kind of, you know, imagining like, I, you know, nobody can imagine, but kind of envisioning like my reaction if if there's a school shooter at my my daughter's school, envisioning fucking President Trump weighing in on it, like is just like my rage would just be so uncontainable that I just don't know how I could do anything but just be filled, just become a ra a monster of rage, and I so I just was wondering kind of how you managed that well i always knew he was a liar but that was the moment where um i developed an absolute determination to make sure he could never ever be our president again um you know he i i always tell people my wife and son are not political 
In fact, they hate that I'm in this whole environment. It's just, it's just they, they, they are, they don't like this. But you know who did in my family? Jamie did, and Jamie had what I used to call the greatest bullshit detector on earth. And during the campaign <clears throat> back then, she. She, she was the one in the house that would sit with me and watch the news. So she would have been, and, what, like in seventh grade or something like that? Uh, back then, yeah. yeah. And she used to sit there and yell at the television, but, but not at, at, at Trump. She'd yell at, like, potential voters, like, saying, come on, people, are you stupid? Do you not see what a liar he is? I mean, Jamie had a bullshit detector. And so here's how I keep grounded. I always think of Jamie. Um, I always think of what happened and how it was preventable. And I always think of those who clearly want to work with decency, civility, and honesty to stop the next one. And those who don't. And, and, um, President Biden, at the time private citizen Biden, called me during the week of the shooting, and then I met so this with him. Is, um, <clears throat> just I just get this like the timeline right. I mean, like really, really private citizen. Like he wasn't running. If it's February twenty eighteen, oh, he was totally like, private not citizen. Running. He hadn't even. He was on his he way to a Bo Biden Foundation event in yeah. New York. He called me while he was on the train, and he was not a candidate for anything. Um, we spent about an hour on the phone. And then three weeks later, he was down in Florida for an event and he met privately with me and Max Schachter for almost an hour. Um, while he had a whole room of people waiting to talk to him, but he just refused to leave us because he knew how important it was. I mean, he's a special human being. But I'll never forget when he said to me towards the end of the phone call, so what's your plan? And I said, I'm not really sure i said i just know and i know i can curse on this yeah you can um, curse I, and i said this to him just like this i just know i want to break the fucking gun lobby and he said well that's your goal but what's your plan he goes because now you have a mission and when he used that word mission and he said i think and he said now you have a mission you have a purpose um those mission and purpose is what keeps me grounded. I always remember what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and I always remember who is in this work to do the right thing and who isn't. And I'm I don't I can't let my anger and emotion cause me to do something that will be detrimental to the greater good. And so I control it. How? Um, <laughs> that would be my challenge. How? Uh, I, I will tell you. Weed gummies? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, um, I should start, but I don't. <laughs> um, Jamie keeps me grounded. I, I, I go, I've talked about, I go to the cemetery a lot. And um, I always talk to Jamie about what's going on. And about how I can't change what happened to her, but how with me as her voice, together we are going to change what happens to others. And as long as um, I know that is my purpose, um, and as long as I know I believe I have Jamie, you see her standing over my shoulder in that picture. Yeah. Um, as long as I know I have her standing over my shoulder... She keeps me grounded. I know it sounds crazy, um, but but she and I have a purpose in this world, and and we're not going to stop. Um, I want to talk about some of the gun policy stuff. But what we were talking in the green room something that happened this week, and um, uh, that I, I found interesting is that you had uh, a Congressman uh, Clark down in in Florida, the Parkland building, the school building itself. Yeah. now has been dormant, I guess, for six years. Um, yeah. The kids go to school at a different school on the campus, and, and they're, they're, they're going to tear it down. But, but politicians and, and policymakers and stuff come through 
just kind of learn lessons about the design yeah. of the building. And like this shit always, always just pissed me off so much about the, oh, we need more door control. I was like, the, <laughs> Parkland had a single entry. Parkland had a, 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 you know, a security guard at the front, right? And I, I think about my high school that had a million entry. You know, I, I just, that stuff pisses me off. When, 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 like, Republicans try to make it about door control instead of about guns. But, you know, there are things we can learn, you know. That doesn't yeah, mean yeah. that we shouldn't try to make the schools better. So I, I just am curious, since you go on those tours, what are the main takeaways from, on that? So there's a that? lot to learn. Um, and, and you're correct. Yesterday we had Rep. Catherine Clark. Last week we had um, Education Secretary Cardona and members of his staff, as well as members of the ATF and the Secret Th Service Threat Assessment Team. Um, over the past few months, we have hosted congressional delegations um, and school administrators. Um, we've invited every Democrat and every Republican. Um, there's been, I think, less than a handful of Republicans who have taken us up on this. Uh, and it is what it is. That's who they are. That said, here's what we can learn, and it's, and, um, after the tour, we always follow it with a, with a, a round table um, so we can talk through the learnings. That building is a time capsule. It has been untouched since the shooting. All the blood is still there. Oh and the God. other body matter is still there. Oh, my God. All, all so when you, the, walk, you walk through it? Uh, I did. I, I didn't do any of the walkthroughs until last week. My first one was with Secretary of Education Cardona. I did Yesterday was that. my second one. All the shards of glass, all of the work that kids were working on is still on the desks. Um, it's all there. It's all there. And so we have a... Why? Some of the is state that the standard office. procedure? Why? What's that? Why is that stand? Is that true of other schools? Like why? Because been... the the building was under the control of the state attorney's office from the from the time of the shooting, and knowing that they would eventually need that to potentially walk a jury through, the building was locked and left. Holy shit! Um, and it is still that way. Um, so when you walk through. I can literally point to you each spot and say, that's the blood of this one. That's the blood of, of, of this one. Here's where my daughter ran. Here's where she died. And take it to the exact spot. Um, and for the families, only a few family members continually do this. Like I said, I just finally start, started doing it. One of the reasons why I didn't do it until last week was last year after the criminal trial, um, Jamie was killed in the hallway. So she's one of the few where there's actual video from the hallway I cameras. I watched the video last year because um, I just had some questions that I needed to have answered. Um, but I was pretty traumatized for a while and I just couldn't bring myself to do the walkthroughs earlier on in this process. Um, but... We have a member of the state attorney's office join us on every one. And a couple of the other parents uh, now with, with me. And we walk them through the entire building, through the timeline, where the shooter went, when he did what, and all of the failures. And so, as I've always said, and this is gets to the lessons, there were failures before, during, and after. The before is all legislative. How it is that we allowed AR-15 sales to go from 2% of all guns sold in 2003 when my daughter was born to over 25% of all guns sold in 2023, only 20 years later. How it is we as a country went from 200 million weapons in America in 2003, only 20 years ago, to over 400 million weapons only 20 years later. There's a direct... Core. Forget every. It's the reason why I wrote the book American Carnage. Everybody will give you a gazillion reasons for gun violence in America. You know, mental health, good guys versus bad guys. Only bad guys have all the bullshit. I literally just told you the only two things you need to know. 
it, 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 it's, it's numbers. As I always told my children, numbers don't lie. Yeah. And I just told you everything you need to know. All the rest is bullshit. The, the, what the NRA did back in the 90s to divide this country into a country of good guys and bad guys. So the good guys, you better run out and buy guns because the bad guys have them. Yep. Okay. Um, was bullshit. And what Wayne LaPierre did days after the Sandy Hook shooting, when he said a line that did not exist in this country until after the Sandy Hook shooting, he said for the very first time, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good, good guy with a gun. Feels like we've lived with that forever. It started after Sandy Hook. They turned <laughs> Sandy Hook into a gun sales bonanza. Yeah. Feels like they did because it was a choice. I mean, I grew up so I, I grew up about a mile from Columbine and was in high school. Then I was I went to I went to private school, but so I, I lived through all that. And there was a moment right after Columbine where there was like a de, an intra NRA debate, you know, where it was like may, we might we maybe should be on the side of more restrictions, you know, more more limits. And the LaPierre side won, right? So like that, that this, this was a human yeah. choice by activists, gun activists in the late 90s. After and Columbine. you can tie what happened in Parkland. And when I talk about legislative failures before him, I really look back to what was possible after Columbine and the fact that the, Wayne LaPierre won and the, their ability to put money into elections and to bullshit studies to justify good guy versus bad guy, um, you can tie it to where we are today, okay? Um, you can look at the Heller decision in 2008, which defined a phrase, common use. Now, a lot of, the big explosion in AR-15 sales happened in 2008. Some will say that was because of the election of Obama, I believe it was because of the phrase common use because the industry immediately went into this manufacturing binge, flooding the streets with these weapons and developing marketing strategies to move them. And they literally had a business strategy to put them into common use. And here we are only 15 years later and all the Republicans, what do they say? You can't do anything. They're in common use. We lost out to a business strategy and the Heller decision. So, so that's one learning is how we got to where we are today. Cause this is not who America always was. When people talk about that, hell no, that's, that's a bunch of shit. In fact, the Bruin decision last year and a half ago struck down a 100 plus year old law that was keeping New Yorkers safe. It wasn't right. striking down a new law that had different people are it was over a hundred years old because we always passed gun safety legislation in america that is who we were we had gun owners but we were responsible about it right that changed because of wayne lapierre and the nra my daughter was a cost of doing business for their strategy um and so that's one learning is okay let's accept the fact that we weren't always this way Let's do everything we can now to start mitigating against all the damage we've done. We now have over 400 million weapons. Um, we still need to try hard to keep them out of the hands of people who intend harm, which is why I think red flag laws should be the law of the land. Um, so that's one learning. But then when you get into the campus, there's other learnings. A, training matters. Uvalde happened years after Parkland. And we saw all the same mistakes, only to a higher scale, even worse. Right. Yeah. Okay. We now have to accept the fact that as a country, gun violence is inevitable. It was preventable, but now it's inevitable. It's foreseeable. And so we have to be prepared. We have to have a different standard for training, a different way of training, a different preparation. You know... When you walk through the building, as we do with everybody, we make a point of pointing out all the fire suppression systems, all the fire alarms that happened. The last time a student or anybody died in a school fire was back in the 50s. <laughs> so, so we need to now build our We're buildings. A little behind on our threat assessments is what you're saying. At the, yeah, at the we now... It, children, we now need to rethink how we build schools and other public buildings to 
account for the reality that there's over 400 million weapons in America. We lost out. We don't have to be passive and do nothing, but that's one of the things we need to do. And so we show how the shooter never entered any of the classrooms. He shot through the non-bulletproof glass, big pane of glass in the door, and was able to just shoot through and never have to actually go look at anybody he was shooting. These yeah. shooters don't want to come face to face. They want to, they, they want to do what they're doing, but they're cowards. Yeah. And so schools need to be built with bulletproof glass, um, with doors that are self-locking. Again, one of the learnings, the only way a teacher could lock the door in this building was from the outside. One of the teachers died while trying to lock the door for his students, okay? My daughter died because the teacher, when they went running one way, he, he locked the door. They, they went into another room. He ended up leaving his key. They were in the hallway when the shooter came back. They got locked out of their room. Uh. So... My daughter died because she was locked out of the room. That's how she ended up in the hallway. Um, so we need to rethink how we handle things like that. Um, the shots were going through all the, the walls because they're not cement. We probably ought to start going back old school with the way we construct and using cinder block all the way through. Um, we have to rethink how we built schools and public buildings, because the reality is we've now armed America because of a party who bought into what the NRA was selling. And we now have to deal with the consequence. Let's, let's be clear. What have they said for the past 20 years? We don't need any new gun laws. Just need to enforce the existing gun laws. I'm on board with that. Let's do, why don't we ever, why aren't we doing that? But, but, but here's the thing. While they were saying that, across the country, we were passing all sorts of new gun laws. We were passing open carry. carry. We yeah. were passing permitless carry. We were passing stand your ground. They were saying no new gun laws while passing new gun laws. Yeah. Okay. They were saying new gun laws are the start of a slippery slope. Well, we've been on a slippery slope and my daughter died because of it. Yeah, I know. And so I get what, so the question is, I'm with you on this. This is the frustrating part of this conversation. I think it's why a lot of people don't like to have it because you are right there. We are at an inevitability point, right? Kind of right. There are all these guns out there. When you have a lot of fucking guns out there, like this stuff is going to happen, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, when you think about things that can be done, like the things that come to my mind now are culture stuff, right? Like guns are not cool. You know, we did, I did, I, th I, I, I had Adam Brody as an actor on this pot, on this pot a while back. And I thought it was interesting that he said, it's like, we stopped smoking in movies. I was like, maybe we should stop, stop shooting in movies. And not, I don't think movies are the reason for it, but I just mean like culture stuff does matter, right? Like we need to think about like guns are not fucking cool, you know, and, and let's stop making. No, you're, you're cool. completely onto something. And so I, I, I don't know if you know, I, I'm a senior advisor to Brady and, um, we're, we're on this whole campaign to show your safety and to change the culture around the way guns are shown in television and movies. Um, and in fact, we just did a big event um, in LA with CAA, Creative Arts Agency, mm -hmm. two months ago. And um, they did, there was another one a month before that with one of the other big agencies. Um, and we brought together writers, producers, actors, and actresses um, to talk about this and just how much they can do with the way guns are written into storylines or not showing conflicts that aren't resolved with a gun. Right. Uh, if you're going to show a gun in a movie, you know, what happens when you see, you know, a cop or a bad guy, they get into a, a car and they just, they throw their gun on the seat, right? Or they just put it in the glove box, unlocked, unsecured. Yeah. Okay. Show somebody getting into a car and putting it into a locked box. Right. There's so many things we can do to drive a safety message. More um, scenes of Cheddar Bob and Eminem shooting himself in the dick. You know, more <laughs> scenes about more scenes like that. See, that guy doesn't um, so cool. 
<laughs> Listen, uh, uh, I'm all I'm all for any approach to show the stupidity of it because let's face it, a lot of these knucklehead gun owners do end up injuring themselves in sometimes um, funny ways because what you just described has actually happened. Of course, um, it has. Yeah. you know uh, there are s- stories uh, that I've read where people have had their guns improperly secured in their pocket and um, they've they've suffered a consequence as a result. <laughs> um, so the other, some of the ones for me, and I'm interested in it for years, so I'm just saying this out, out loud. I, I, I'm a politics guy, right? So I always have politics in my mind. Like I feel like Democrats should be more on offense on guns, particularly on some obvious things. Like the Parkland shooter was 19, right? I, like people under, I don't, I, I think that like the notion that a 17 year old, 18 year old has a gun, 19 year old is crazy. Like, like they, like it should be illegal for them to carry guns. And I think this would be a winning issue for Democrats. I don't think most, I think even red state parents, when they start to get pictures on their TVs of what a 17 year old looks like, what a sick, they remember how young they look, you know? So I, th- I think that is it. Another one was the white house this week talking about gun storage and gun safety. Yeah. So I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on those two. No, or Tim, you, you're, you're right. Listen, before Parkland, before 2018, Democrats were petrified of this issue because they always got clobbered. As soon as they spoke, the NRA and its right. forces spoke more loudly and more aggressively and honestly with more, they caused fear. You know, we're used to kind of nastiness and, and, and fear in politics now and threats in politics now. It's become a norm. Donald Trump, really implemented the model that the NRA used for a long time before Donald Trump, yeah. okay? Because that's what they did. And, and Democrats were petrified. They just immediately backed down. And they also would, in certain states, lose elections on this issue because of how misunderstood it was. What we did after Parkland, um, the parents and the kids, we refused to shut up. We refused to back down. We started taking them on, on social media. I went, I was clear, I'm going to break the fucking NRA. Um, one of my very first friends in the movement was Governor Phil Murphy. And he, and I had a very public meeting early on where he said, what do you want me to do? I said, go after their money. And you know what? He started going after their money. Um, and it's working. It's working. And so we refused to back down. We refused to give in to fear. We refused to shut up and go away. And only months later, the 2018 election, remember all those NRA ratings that people used to like to wear? You wanted to show you were an A-rated NRA member? The NRA got rid of the rating system just before that election, and they stopped wearing that stuff. Okay? And we fired members, House members, that were the strongest NRA members, and we flipped the House in 2018. And in 2020, we elected Biden, and we gave him a Senate. Now, this wasn't the only issue. A lot of it was because people just we couldn't have Trump. This issue mattered in that election. Yeah. And you see now Democrats not afraid to lead and take on this issue. You see Biden who um, was able to sign the Safer Communities Act. Much weaker than it could have been, but it was bipartisan. First one in 30 years. Yeah, but it was bipartisan. And so, yeah. and we were able to get that done. You see all the executive actions that he's doing, and he knows he'll be judged on it in the next election. And he believes, and he's right, this will be a winning issue for him. We now have the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, which did organize that meeting in the White House yesterday with school principals and Secretary Cardona, who was there to talk about his visit to Parkland last week, as well as um, uh, Connecticut parent, uh, warrior mom, Kristen Song, who I love dearly, whose son Ethan was killed in a friend's home because there was an unsecured weapon. And so the White House is leaning in hard. 
Catherine Clark was here yesterday because the Democrats are leaning in hard. They're no longer afraid of this issue, but they were. This will be a winning issue going forward for those who want to reduce gun violence. America now gets it, they see it, and they're tired of it. Are there any other specific policies? I red flag we talked about, age limits, safety, you know, uh, any, anything else that jumps to mind for you? Listen, I tell everybody, um, my, I, I look at things in terms of three goals. I want to reduce the gun violence death rate. I want to reduce the instances of, of gun violence. And I want to reduce the severity of gun violence when it happens. And so within those three goals, my hope is I can talk to any politician and any party about ways to do it. Um, that's not an anti-gun set of goals. It's an anti-gun violence set of goals. Yep. How do we do it? Red flag laws. They should be the law of the land. And any politician who tells you they disagree with that, they should be fired. Okay, most of those on the right will say, oh, due process, due process. It's built into the Florida law. And then the Florida law has now been used over 12,000 times. And the dirty little secret about Florida, if you dig into the numbers, it's being used mostly by the red county sheriffs, not the blue county sheriffs. Okay, yeah. because they know they want because they don't want to. They're gun guys, but they do want to stop the random gun violence. It's working. Raise the age to 21. Let's or 25, but or know, 25. We'll, we'll start with 21. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I was I was a dumbass at 23. I wouldn't want myself with a gun in 23, but yeah, sure, 21. We'll start there. Background checks should have no loopholes. Okay, whether you're buying it in a store yeah. or buying it in a show or buying it from somebody who's managed to call themselves a a uh, who's managed to get a firearms license, but they say, oh, we don't make a profit. There should be no loopholes. Anyone who's spending money on a gun should have to pass a background check. But I will go one step further. There is a law currently sitting in Congress that will never get a hearing in this session, but it will when um, we have Speaker Jeffries, and it's called Jamie's Law. And Jamie's Law seeks to do nothing more than extend background checks to ammunition. We now have to deal with the reality that there's 400 million weapons in America. In this country, if you are a prohibited purchaser of a firearm, you're also prohibited from buying bullets, but there's no requirement for a background check on bullets and ammunition. And so you could have gotten your gun illegally. You could have gotten your gun without a background check. And then you can walk into any store and buy the ammunition and nobody will check. If we pass Jamie's law, we save lives immediately. I'm on board for Jamie's law. And that relates to my last one on this is <clears throat> what high capacity mags is another one for me. It's like, okay, what, all what, right. Is that, I don't think that that's in this. It doesn't feel like a second amendment issue to me. All right. That, that you can, sh you know, kill 15 people without having to reload. Uh, it's one of the lessons of the, it, it's one of the lessons of the walkthrough from the school. Every opportunity people had to run for safety during the shooting was when the killer had to stop and reload. Yeah. So don't get tell me you need it for self-defense. You need to be able to it, fire it, off it, 15 it, fucking bullets at one time before reloading. Okay? It's one you're, of the you're fucked if you need that for self-defense. It's one of the bullshit arguments. Again, it's one of those things, which is why we wrote the book American Carnage. Yeah. You know, it's to take on all the lies and all the myths. Nobody's saying we want to take away the guns of good guys or any of that nonsense. But we can do a lot to save lives. And we ought to agree on that. Yeah. If you need the 15 bullets to shoot a deer, maybe you should start looking into a different hobby. A different hobby? Okay? Besides hunting. All right. You're not, you're not very good if you, if you need to reload um, that many times. <clears throat> All right. Um, Fred, I really appreciate this, man. And, and back to the permission to be honest. You don't have to do this one if you don't want. But I just I keep staring at Jamie over your shoulder. And I just, I'm wondering if you have any memories of her as a dancer you'd like to share. Because just, I'm just looking, I've just been looking at it the whole interview. <sighs> Well, and, and that is a, a, um, a painting from a real photo. Jamie uh, was a competitive dancer, but everyone in the dance world knew her for these incredible flying leaps that she did. And there was just this one photo that very quickly uh, became iconic after the shooting that somebody had posted of one of her flying leaps. And an artist painted that for us off of that photo. Um, but I will tell you, 
My daughter, what sticks with me most was her commitment and her dedication. Um, when she danced, the, she had a quote. She didn't make up the quote, but she found it, and it just motivated everything she did. Um, dreams and dedication are a powerful combination, and that quote guides me now. I have a dream of ending gun violence in America, and I am dedicating my life to it. Fred, you inspire me. If there's ever anything I can do to call me off the sidelines, um, door is open. Thank you so much for doing this interview, and um, hopefully we can beat this orange fucker's ass in November and uh, get rid of him once and for all. How about that? We 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 have to beat him, and we will. I'm I, I am I'm I refuse to even think of this as being um, a choice or an option. <laughs> so we just have to, and we will. Amen but we all that. better Fred, work our asses off for it. We will. Amen to that. Fred Guttenberg, author of Find the Helpers, American Carnage. He runs Orange Ribbons for Jamie. We didn't get into Pause of Love. Uh, it's cute. Pause of Love is cute. So go check that out. Go to Orange Ribbons for Jamie. Check it out. Something that Fred's wife is working on. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks, Tim.